Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to begin today by asking you to think for a moment if you could ever imagine anyone telling God what to do. And as you ponder that question, please remember who he is. He is the creator of the world, the designer of the universe, the almighty and eternal God. So with that illustrative description of who God is, could you ever imagine anyone stepping forward and telling this omnipotent divine being what to do? No friggin' way. <laughs> And I'm sure I'm speaking for most of you here today when I say that. But wait a minute. Hasn't this been the very thing that man has been doing ever since creation? Telling God what to do? And while it hasn't been a face-to-face -face contact, because no one has ever physically sat down in front of God to talk directly to him, the closest blessing we have is in prayer and at the communion table. However, I think that if that were to be the case, that we would physically stand before God, we would be the most sheepest and the most anxious of people. In fact, I'm guessing we wouldn't even be able to utter a single word because we would be so overcome by awe, reverence, fear. And the thought of telling God what to do, well... <laughs> That would never even enter the picture. However, that being said, the whole history of man has been one of vocal and open opposition to God by refusing or questioning what God wants. And from the opening pages of Genesis to the closing chapters of Revelation, the Bible records this never-ceasing struggle that has raged since the beginning of time. In other words, man, by his very attitude and nature, tells God what to do and what not to do. God suggests one way, man another. God desires obedience, man disobeys. The divine against the human, the human against the divine, man versus God. Think for a moment about Jesus. When Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, came to earth on a rescue mission to redeem and bring salvation to the world, what happened? His teachings, his life, his will, all suffered the sting of opposition. Even his birth brought immediate resistance from earthly rulers. Yes, Christ's entire life is an account of the constant struggle with man. A struggle that came to a climax with his horrific death upon the cross. God's word for today follows this same pattern. And it reveals to us a basic conflict that exists in all of life. The conflict between God and man. Today's reading was from our gospel lesson from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16, verse 21 to verse 23. And I would ask you if you're able to rise out of respect for the glorious truth of God. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. These are your holy words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us in its truth. Your word, O oh Lord, is truth. Thank you. Please be seated. Now for a little more background to this text, it was now nearing the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. 
And Christ had for over two years now been telling his disciples that he was one day going to die and then be raised again. In John's Gospel, we are told that Jesus had at first spoken about these things in mystic figurative language. He had spoken of the temple of his body being destroyed and raised up the third day. He said the time would come when he would be lifted up as the serpent had been lifted up by Moses in the wilderness. He told them, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, they will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my very own flesh. And Jesus spoke this way because they and others were still immature in their faith and would not have been able to accept the plain truth that he, the Christ, was to die on the cross for the sins of the world. So Jesus led them slowly into this truth. However, as we explore our text, it seems clear that they still did not understand. I want to go back for a moment to our gospel lesson from last week because it ties directly into today's lesson. In that text, Jesus asked his disciples, Who am I? And we all heard Peter's bold display of faith when he said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We also learned that Jesus was very pleased with that answer that God the Father had revealed to Peter. But during last week's sermon, I did not present the closing verse in that text because I wanted to briefly expand upon it today. Let's read that verse now. Matthew 16 verse 20 reads, then Jesus strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Now that's an odd response, isn't it? Here they had just confessed Jesus as the Christ, but Jesus says mum's the word. Why would Jesus tell the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ? I thought confessing that Jesus is the Savior is a good thing. Heck, I'm up here harping on it all the time from this pulpit telling us as Christians to use our God-given gifts, get off our butts, and go out and tell others about this Jesus who saves. But yet here, Christ strictly charged his disciples to tell no one. In fact, there are numerous examples throughout the New Testament of Jesus seeming to tone down his role as the long-awaited Savior after performing a miracle or showing something extraordinary about himself. But why? Our gospel this morning shows us why. You see, while Peter got the words exactly right, you are the Christ, you're the Son of God. He and the other disciples didn't really, at this time, know what being the Christ truly meant. They couldn't grasp that to be the Christ means to be the victim of the most unfair, most unfathomable, phony trial in history, where the only man who ever lived a perfect life would be sentenced to death. They didn't understand that being the Christ means that Jesus would exchange his perfect and holy righteousness for the rotten, filthy sins of the entire world. You see, in their minds, they were thinking that Jesus was to be an earthly king, a new ruler for Israel. They couldn't yet comprehend Jesus as the suffering Savior the lamb who would be led to the slaughter. This is where we'll pick up our lesson for today. With Jesus immediately after Peter's confession explaining to these disciples what his role as God's son really means. Matthew 16 verse 21 reads, From that time, right after Peter's confession, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. 
We see here Jesus is explaining in direct and honest language what it means to be the Christ. And he is telling his disciples and us that man is against God. Now this is not what the disciples expected to hear. They were not expecting a picture of suffering. They were not expecting a horrific death by the most inhumane and shameful method possible, crucifixion. And certainly they were not expecting a resurrection on the third day. In fact, it sounds like Peter completely missed that part. <laughs> but these words of Jesus undoubtedly make clear for us one important thing. That man is against God. In fact, our text validates that exact point when Peter, after hearing these words, confronts Jesus, the Christ, God in the flesh, and begins telling him what to do. Matthew 16, verse 22 reads, And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Think what's going on here. Here we have Peter, a mere mortal, standing in direct conflict with the Lord. Man versus God. And remember, this is occurring right after Peter had just confessed Jesus as the Christ. And now Peter is rebuking Jesus, which literally means he was scolding him. No wonder Jesus told the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ because they didn't know who the Christ was and their misunderstanding would have caused them to proclaim a false Christ. It's right here at this point where the continuing conflict exists between God and man. And it centers in one basic idea. What does the cross of Christ really mean? And why is it the only way of salvation? Now sadly, most people today don't give one wit about the cross. Why? Because they fail to see the damning power of their sin, and they therefore are blind to the true necessity of what the cross of Christ means. And if they think of Christ being crucified, they look at that event as just another kind of martyrdom, therefore rejecting the blood theology of the gospel. They reject the idea of a sacrifice which involves substitution, redemption by the blood of God's Son, and the cleansing of the soul from guilt by faith, accomplished only through Christ's loving act of atonement. Yes, unfortunately, most people could care less about the teachings of the church, the suffering Jesus, his cross, or his shed blood upon it. They instead say or take the position, no, my desire in life is to be a good person, to earn a decent living, be famous perhaps, be narcissistic in my friends and get on Facebook and know everybody and do everything the world does and to mind my own business and my relationship to my God is none of yours. <laughs> That's the conflict. That's what Peter was saying. He didn't know it, but that's what was going on. You see, when Peter said, No, Jesus, don't you dare go up to Jerusalem. They will kill you. Well, Peter meant well. He certainly loved his Lord. But he got it all wrong. And because he got it all wrong, he stood against God. So what about you who are here today? What about you who are listening to me right now online? Do you stand against God? Do you even understand what it means to stand against God? This is a critical question to know the answer to. You see, most people believe that if there really is anything to this matter of living again, it's in the way a person lives. In other words, if I just live the best I can live, 
If I'm kind of nice to others, if I have a good family, if I have a good job and I'm a decent person, well, I can go to heaven. But that's wrong. And this is the continual struggle that we face in the church and among people. You see, God says, listen, you are a sinner and I am a holy God. And your sins, no matter how small or big, block you from heaven and eternal life. And like it or not, this is the way I am. This is the way it is. I am what I am. But I do have a solution. Because I've sent my son into the world to save you. Because I love you. In fact, I love all the people in the world, even the ones you don't like. And I want them all to be converted and I want everyone to be saved. But they're not going to be saved if they don't love and trust in Jesus. And that's where you come in. You see, I want you to go out and tell them, starting with your own neighbor. And I want you to share with them that I love all people, but only in Christ. And you must tell them the truth about me. You have to tell them that I am a holy, righteous, perfect God who cannot and will not tolerate sin. Which means I can't accept them as they are, no matter how good they may see themselves. But because I love every person so much, you tell them I have sent Jesus to live the perfect life in their place and then to die the death they deserve for their sin on the cross so that they don't have to die. And you tell them if they will believe and trust in the Savior, their sins will be completely forgiven and I will give them peace and joy like they have never experienced before. And because of my merciful grace, you tell them I will grant them and you entrance into my glorious kingdom for all eternity. This is the message that the disciples would eventually understand and embrace. But it would not occur until after Christ appeared to them after his resurrection. Because at that time, Jesus opened their minds to understand. Luke 24, verse 45 to 48 reads, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. It was after the disciples understood that Jesus was sent by God the Father to suffer, die, and rise again for the forgiveness of sins that Christ sent them out as witnesses. That is why you and I are now to be witnesses. Because we know the message of the cross. The scriptures have been revealed to us. Which means, loved ones, Christians who love their Lord are to use their gifts, their talents, and their love for Jesus to reach others. But prior to this time, before Jesus opened their minds, Peter and the disciples had it all wrong because they didn't really know who the Christ was and why he came. That is why Jesus stopped Peter's rebuke immediately after he said them to Jesus with these words. Matthew 16, verse 23 reads, but Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God. You're setting them on the things of man. Now, first off, notice how quickly Jesus responded to Peter's remarks. 
He wastes no time spinning around and smashing the serpent's head. And Jesus does not for one moment entertain the tempting thought or turn it over in his mind. This, friends, is a great example for us who frequently hang around with the serpent and then find his poisonous fangs lodged deep within us. But those are tough words from Jesus. Not only did he put an immediate end to Peter's scolding, but he also accused his own loved disciple of working for Satan. <laughs> You see, unwittingly, and though moved by the best of intentions, Peter had made himself an agent of the devil. And this is a warning for us, friends. It is a warning for us to watch our love, our good intentions, our best acts, in case, perhaps after all, they agree with Satan and not with Christ. But Jesus here really laid into Peter because his words in reality were undermining God's entire plan of salvation. And unbeknownst to Peter, he was repeating in a different form the very temptation that the devil presented to Jesus out in the wilderness. Let's go back to the start of Christ's ministry for a moment and read that in part. Matthew 4 verses 8 and 9 reads, Again the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Now with this temptation, the same temptation Satan used Peter, Satan was attempting to get Jesus to reject the way of the cross and instead accept the treasures of the world and become a rich and powerful national ruler. But Jesus rebuked the devil saying, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. It's in this same way, loved ones, that Satan works in your life and mine. You see, he tempts us. He seduces us. He lures our flesh with the enticements of the world away from the cross of Jesus Christ, thus turning us against God. So the question must be, what do you personally believe about the cross? And friends, there are, are no options given in the Bible about this matter, by the way. The Bible's clear. The cross is essential to your faith. That's why Jesus told his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things, die and rise again on the third day. You see, Jesus knew it is only by believing in the cross for your salvation that you will ever, ever inherit eternal life. Not to believe in the cross. Throwing the cross away, putting my things in front of the cross, is to forfeit eternal life. For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are saved, it is the power of God. This, friends, is the vital message for life. And while I could certainly stand up here this morning and enumerate the many in various ways, you and I are guilty of not setting our minds on the things of God, but instead setting them on the things of man. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to beat you up with the long laundry list of the many different ways you personally and me too. <laughs> have put up roadblocks and hindrances to the way, truth, and the life. But make no mistake about it. It is clear from the words of Jesus that any person who does not uphold the cross as the only way of salvation is being used by Satan. 
And don't for a moment believe that Satan is not around because he is very much alive. He is cunning, he is evil, and he is viciously opposed to Christ's death on the cross. And he does not want you to be saved. He does not want me to preach. And he doesn't want you or anyone else to talk about the death of Jesus for salvation. But that's exactly what we're called to do, friends. And we will do it if we love the Lord. Today we learn that the devil attempted to use Peter's ignorance about what it means to be the Christ to stand against God by tempting Jesus. But Jesus resisted the temptation and kept his appointment with the cross. It is on that very cross where Jesus died a gruesome and bloody death as he hung in anguish for your sin and your unrighteousness. But on that same cross, with his substitutionary death, he satisfied God's justice for you. And he earned for you the complete forgiveness of your sins. And with his glorious resurrection from the dead, Christ opened heaven to everyone who will believe and trust in him. After Jesus came out of that grave, he gave Peter and all the disciples a clear understanding of what it means to be the Christ. And just a few short weeks later on the day of Pentecost, Peter, the man who once stood against God, preached the magnificent confession that the Holy Spirit gave him to preach. And he now understood this confession so well that he eventually lost his life on earth for it. Friends, Peter and his fellow apostles suffered much for their confession of faith. And they wrote this revelation down so that the church could pass it down through generations upon generations. Now that confession is ours to use. Loved ones, at times we too will fail to understand God's ways, just like Peter thinking we know better than God. But these faults can comfort us, not as excuses for our faults, but as assurances that our Lord will not reject us on their account. He will simply correct our faults through his word. Because Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And those of us who trust in him have already received his promise of the forgiveness of sins and the life that will never end. Remember that as you go home today. Glorious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for your words today. God, open our hearts now to allow the Holy Spirit to burn that truth within us, to give the hope of everlasting life to those who do not know you, to let them know it's so easy to be saved, they just have to trust in the Lord Jesus, receive him into their lives, and that's it. Father, be with those who do not know you. Open their hearts now to receive you. In Jesus' holy and precious name, we thank him and pray. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.